How's it going, ladies and gentlemen? Mr. Donahue here once again. This time we're going to take a look at exceptions to the octet rule. So our objectives will be to describe the limitations of the octet rule and explain why sometimes having less than or more than an octet is appropriate. And yeah, I know what you're thinking. The exceptions to a rule? Come on. But still, chemistry isn't as bad as English with all of its exceptions. At least that's what I leisurely tell my eight overweight neighbors. <laughs> the whole I before E thing. Anyway, the octet rule. So atoms tend to bond or transfer electrons in such a way to achieve the stable configuration of eight valence electrons. So if we looked at sodium chloride, well, sodium's configuration is 2-8-1 and chlorine's 2-8-7. And when they bond, they transfer one electron from sodium to chlorine and they both end up with eight valence electrons. And that's where this octet rule comes from. I can also look at CO2, right? CO2, I could draw this way but when I look at the formal charges, that tells me that's not the best way to have my Lewis structure. So instead, I make double bonds so that that carbon ends up with a stable octet and everything has an octet. Now, why is that? Why is 8 a magic number? Part of the reason is because the S and the P sublevels are full. So we know that the S can hold, you know, two electrons and the P sublevel can hold a total of six. So whenever we're filling things... 8 is a magic number because it's when the S and the P sublevel are full. So the octet rule has its limitations, however. For example, if we took a look at BH3, well, that, that's a total of six valence electrons that we can work with because B has three, each H has one. So how am I going to draw that? Well, B bonded to an H, bonded to an H, bonded to the H. Well, hey, these H's only have two, but we know that about hydrogen. O. <laughs> that's an exception we're familiar with. But then even this boron, it only has six. But this is the best Lewis structure we can come up with for BH3. So let's talk about exceptions. First exception is going to be when you have an odd number of electrons. Some molecules have an odd number of electrons, making it impossible to get a complete octet. You have an odd number. You can't get to 8 if you have an odd number. No way you can do it. The go-to example is NO. So we have a total of 11 valence electrons. So we can draw two structures either like this where oxygen has four electrons it's keeping to itself, and then nitrogen has three. And then we got four in the middle for a total of 11. Or it could be like this, where nitrogen has four valence electrons that it's keeping to itself, and oxygen has three. So there's no way that you can get to eight. You're going to have to end up with you know an odd number because you have an odd number of electrons. Another exception is when you have less than an octet. So it's rare to occur, but common in a couple of elements like boron and beryllium and hydrogen, but you probably you know, are familiar with that about hydrogen. And the way to figure out you know, if that's the best Lewis structure or not, where you don't have an octet, where you have less than an octet, is to check the formal charges. So if we take a look at BF3, so I know boron has three valence electrons and each one of these fluorines has seven. So I have a total of 24 valence electrons which means I'm going to draw a couple of structures. I can have BF3 look like this. I complete the octets for all the fluorines. But another way is to go, hey, that boron doesn't have an octet. So let me make a double bond with one of those fluorines so that it does. But then when you check formal charges, it's not going to work out. For a couple of reasons. One, when I have this set up, the formal charge on boron is going to be minus one, and on this fluorine, it's going to be plus one. Now, that doesn't really make sense because I know fluorine is the most electronegative element that we, you know, talk about. Its electronegativity is 4.0, so if any one of those is going to end up with a negative charge because they're hogging electrons, it's going to be the fluorine. So this structure doesn't really make sense based on the formal charges. So this is what we're going to get, even though this boron only has six valence electrons and it doesn't have an octet. It's okay. It's an exception. Another exception is having more than an octet. Now, this is more common in elements in period three or greater. And the reason for that is they have access to this D sublevel. So eight valence electrons is the S being full with two and the P being full with six, right? But if we had a D sublevel, then we can start putting more electrons in there so we can end up with more than eight. Second period elements don't have this D sublevel to work with, so it, they're not going to show this as an exception. 
If you're in period three or greater, you can have more than eight. But generally, you want to choose a Lewis structure that does satisfy the octet rule whenever that's possible. So let's take a look at PCl5. Again, phosphorus has five valence electrons. Each of these chlorines has seven. So I'm going to end up with 40 valence electrons. Which, all right, let me start drawing. I got phosphorus, one, two, three, four, five bonds to this five chlorines. And right now you can already see that this phosphorus has more than eight. This phosphorus has 10 valence electrons. After I finish my octets for all of those chlorines, I'm gonna have placed all 40 of my valence electrons and there's nothing I can do about it. This phosphorus in PCL5 is gonna have more than eight. Phosphorus is in period three, so it's that, you know, it's what it is. You're, that's the best Lewis structure, even though it has more than eight. So to summarize, can you describe the limitations of the octet rule and explain why sometimes having less than or more than an octet is appropriate? That's pretty much it. You know, I hope you found that helpful. I'll see you in class. Okay, bye.